Te da koto te fano o Auckland Unitarius. Te da koto na mana huri. No mai hara mai hara mai ki te ne fara karakia. A te ato te da koto te da tato katoa. We welcome you to this space made sacred by Auckland Unitarians for 118 years. And we invite you, come, come, whoever you are. Do you hear that voice calling you, calling us? That voice which calls us together here today in this room, made holy by our presence and by the sacred breath we share in our singing and speaking and silence. That voice which calls us to remember that we are not alone and that we are inextricably linked to all other life, woven into a vast tapestry of ex existence. We are a powerful, integral, and holy part. And just as we have been called together here today, we act as the voice, the heart, the hands of another call, the call to walk with the wanderers, sing and dance with the worshipers, proclaim the memory of those who have taken their leave, wrap the despairing and the broken in the arms of love and community. And we hold the hands of all of us who have broken our vows and call us back again and again to the covenant and work of justice, humility, and steadfast faithfulness. For this, we are here together today. So my friends, come yet again. Come, let us worship together. I especially welcome you if you are a guest or visitor. You honor us by your presence. You should know that we consider the next hour the prelude to morning tea, our sacrament of hospitality. Please join us. It won't be complete without you. Much of today's topic, the history of tomorrow, has to do with the question of whether or not we have free will. For some, the world we are creating is making the idea as obsolete and empty as words like soul and God. I'm not convinced. I turn to the words of poet Tom, Thomas Harking as a response. Is our path laid out before us or is it something that we choose? Are we guaranteed a victory? Except, is success just ours to lose? How much free will do we have, if any, after all? It seems when things are on the up, that is when we fall. Is that the way it is meant to be? A life of ups and downs, ever-shifting waters, and in which we are doomed to drown? Or do the choices that we make determine how life goes? I'd like to think this is the case, but who amongst us knows? I like this chalice, that we may hear the melody of life and find ourselves singing harmony. May we be open to the dissonances in the song of the land and its people, that we might be part of the world's urging toward justice peace and love. May we feel in our bones the rhythms of life and the land and find ourselves dancing. When recently selecting topics for my March talks, I was intrigued by historian Yuval Harari's subtitle to Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, the sequel to his book, Homo Sapien, A Brief History of Humankind. The downside is I would have to read it first in a hurry. <laughs> I wasn't disappointed as it ticked my boxes for a good read 
was well written. It was entertaining. I learned lots of things. And it made me think critically. What I wasn't prepared for were the chilling possibilities he laid out for the future of human beings. To my mind, it makes 1984 an animal farm, larks in the park, suitable for bedtime reading to children. Harari's first book wrestles with how we humans reached our present state to take just one data point, a mere 150,000 years ago, there were approximately one million humans alive on Earth. Today, there are more than 7.3 billion of us, with more than one new human being added to the total each second. So what does the future hold? So what will we continue to grow in number and power as a species in ways that increase wealth inequality, exacerbate climate change, and hasten extinction rates of various plants and animals, perhaps including even our own? Or will we also grow in wisdom and responsibility? Harari seeks to answer that in his second book. The Latin name for our species is Homo sapiens, meaning wise human. Harari's title, Homo Deus, means godlike human and invites us to reflect on the ways that our increasingly godlike powers as a species have both tremendous promise for good and terrible potential for harm. His is not an optimistic view. Fortunately, I'm steeped in Unitarian thought about the future. Our closing hymn, 145, is new to this congregation, but the third verse captures our view. A freedom that reveres the past, but trusts the dawning future more, and bids the soul in search of truth adventure boldly and explore. We are a religious movement that seeks to live responsibly and well in our globalized, pluralistic, postmodern world, and we are not stupid. We know that there are some potential threats, trends, and threats of which we need to be aware, aware that aware we could be preparing to meet and shape them. While I do not share all, if not many, of Harari's assumptions, he does lay out some of them for us that I think are very real. In a nub, Homo Deus makes the case that we are now at a unique juncture in the story of our species. For the first time in history, Harari writes, more people die today from eating too much than from eating too little. More people die from old age than from infectious diseases. And more people commit suicide than are killed by soldiers, terrorists, and criminals combined. Having subdued, though by no means vanquished, famine, famine pestilence, and war, Harari argues we can now train our sights on higher objectives eternal happiness, everlasting life, and seeking bliss and immortality, he writes. Humans are in fact trying to upgrade themselves into gods. Looking to the future, one of the major trends that Harari foresees, I take very seriously, is what he calls dataism. In effect, an emerging religion of data what is religion? One of the many definitions of religion is from theologian Paul Tillich, who argues that something is a religion if it is the ultimate concern of an individual or group. From that perspective, Harari is correct that the growing fervor around data collection, 
management and analysis is increasingly religious for its ad adherents, at least in Silicon Valley. Fitbits, for example, are one of among many wearable devices that collect data, including the number of steps walked, heart rate, quality of sleep, steps climbed, and other personal metrics involved in fitness. Those of us with iPhones may or may not know that if you click on that heart icon on your home screen that says health, Apple is collecting as much as possible of that same data about you, depending on how much we carry our iPhone. Back in 1984, ironically, Apple launched a Super Bowl advertisement for the Mac, which declared 1984 won't be like 1984. The ad subtext was that Apple computers were freedom from Big Brother. Ironically, Apple may be one of today's new Big Brothers. To say more about both the potential promise and peril of personal data collection, consider a study that Facebook recently conducted on more than 86,000 people. The same 100-item personality questionnaire was completed by individuals about themselves, work colleagues, friends, family members, and spouses about that individual. And three, a Facebook algorithm about that individual. Then the results were compared. The Facebook algorithm predicted the volunteers' answers based on monitoring their Facebook likes, which web pages, images, and clips they tagged with the like button. And amazingly, the algorithm needed, to, needed a set of only 10 likes in order to outperform the predictions of work colleagues. It needed 70 likes to outperform friends, 150 likes to outperform family members, and three likes to outperform spouses. In other words, if you happen to have clicked 300 likes on your Facebook account, the Facebook algorithm can predict your opinions and de desires better than your husband or wife or partner. I have been on Facebook about a decade, and I'm somewhat stingy about how much free data I give Facebook. I still make occasional posts and click like on some other's postings. I get a lot of benefit from Facebook, from increased connection with friends, family, and colleagues, to increased awareness of trends of both personal and political interests. But we all need to be increasingly aware of the snowballing implications of the information many of us are giving away. To name just one among many implications, that Facebook study implies that in future US presidential elections, Facebook could know not only the political opinions of tens of millions of Americans, but also who among them are the critical swing voters and how these voters might be swung. As I am definitely not a swing voter, being 100% opposed to Trump and his Republican enablers, my newsfeed is not likely to be a target of his base. Recently, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook co-founder co and chief executive officer, has been in the process of visiting all 50 US states. During his visits, he's been doing very similar activities as candidates for political office. He may have nothing more in mind than better understanding of the many different lives of Facebook book users across his country in order to improve his product. Or maybe he is planning to run for president. I don't know, either way. But I invite you to consider this quote from Harari which lands somewhere between the flippant and the profound. In the heyday of European imperialism, 
conquistadors and merchants bought entire islands and countries in exchange for colored beads. In the 21st century, our personal data is probably the most valuable resource most humans still have to offer. And we are giving it away to the tech giants in exchange for email services and funny cat videos. In fact, the one mortal sin of this new religion of dataism is not giving your personal data away freely. That being said, there are positive benefits. Public monitoring based on Google searches called Google Flu Trends can already give a warning about flu outbreaks 10 days before traditional health services. It could be even more accurate, of course, if Google also searched private emails for signals of flu outbreaks. Or consider the forthcoming potential of autonomous cars. If we were collectively willing to give up the privacy of our location and let algorithms know in advance where we are, where we want to go, and when we want to get there, then experts estimate that we could replace one billion private cars, which spend most of their time sitting around unused, with 50 million communal cars, whose use is optimized by algorithms. We would also need far fewer roads, bridges, tunnels, and parking spaces. And we would lose less time and equanimity and traffic, and traffic jams. To give another example along these lines, how many of you use Google Maps? The rest of you just get lost. Okay. <laughs> Even when I'm driving familiar roads, I sometimes turn on Google Maps because it lets me know if there is an unexpected traffic backup for any confluence of, of reasons, and if so, what my potential options are for rerouting. This app has frequently saved me a lot of time, and more than once, I've ended up stuck in traffic because I was not using my mapping map. Of course, when I have it on, I'm giving Google lots of data about myself. But my larger point is actually one level beyond that. Currently, all the various mapping apps give control to individual drivers. They present the situation and ask if you want to take an alternative route. But, but as some of you may have experienced, they can cause a bunch of people using the same mapping app to create a secondary traffic jam on a small side road. Excuse me. The next generation of mapping apps may try to think for us. Maybe it will inform only half the drivers that Route 2 is open, while keeping this information secret from the other half. Thereby, pressure will be eased on Route 1 without blocking Route 2. More perniciously, maybe the better routes will be given to users who pay extra for a pro level of the app. I'll give you just one more example of the many different ways the religion of data could take us into the, the future. People may one day in the not too distant future find themselves picking up a smartphone and asking Apple's Siri, Amazon's Alexa, Google's Assistant, or Microsoft's Cortana, you know, depending on your corporate overlord of choice, and finding themselves asking, Siri, Alexa, Assistant, Cortana, whom should I marry? And you might hear this answer. Well, I've known you since the day you were born. I've read all your emails, recorded all your phone calls, know your favorite films, your DNA, and the entire biometric history of your heart. I have exact data about each date you went on, and if you want, I can show you second-by-second second graphs of your heart rate, blood pressure, and sugar levels whenever you want, went on a date with John or Paul. And naturally, I know them as well as I know you. Based on all this information, on my superb algorithms, and on decades worth of 
statistics about millions of relationships, I advise you to go with John with an 87% probability that you will be more satisfied with him in the long run. Indeed, I know you so well that I also know you don't like the answer. Paul is much more handsome than John. And because you especially give ex external appearances too much weight, you secretly wanted me to say Paul. My algorithms, which are based on the most up-to-date studies and statistics, say that looks have only a 14% impact on the long-term success of romantic relationships. So even though I took Paul's looks into account, I still tell you that you would be better off with John. That sort of dating, big data style, may or may not sound appealing. But you might ask whether it could be a helpful perspective to consider, irrespective of whether you decide to follow its advice. There is so much more to say about all this, but for now I'll say this. There is a lot of fear-mongering happening, happening these days around immigration. I invite you to consider that all that energy might be more fruitfully spent planning for a transition to a future in which not immigrants, but robots and other forms of artificial intelligence really are coming for our jobs. And the jobs under threat of robotization are not only of bus cab drivers, telemarketers, insurance underwriters, sports referees, cashiers, chefs, waiters, tour guides, construction laborers, and security guards, but also doctors, pharmacists, teachers, music composers, artists. Few people want my job anymore, so I'm not particularly worried that an artificially intelligent robot will be interested in giving next week's sermon. This is where Harari's dataism, his religion of data, can challenge us to ask, what is our deepest, most authentic, ultimate concerns? On the brink of, of a potential paradigm shift from homo sapiens, wise humans, to homo deus, godlike humans, augmented through algorithms, nanotechnology, and wearable implanted data processing, we may have the opportunity to ask ourselves anew, what are people for? If we allow the answer to be that people are for the so-called bottom line of corporate profit alone, then we are headed towards some form of dystopia along the lines of Orwell's 1984. But there are alternative paths in which people demand a global ethic, such as the triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit. Financial profit is still a factor, but it must be balanced against the well-being of people and the long-term sustainability of this planet. Earlier, I quoted verse 3 of Hymn 145 as resonant with those themes of Harari's book that we Unitarians tend to seek, a freedom that reveres the past but trusts the dawning future more. In contrast to orthodoxies, which tend to be focused on and limited by the past, we tend to be a future-oriented people. And as I conclude, a helpful guide for living into such a future responsibility comes from the fourth and final verse of that historic hymn. Prophetic church, the future waits your liberating ministry. Go forward in the power of love. Proclaim the truth that makes us free. Go forth in simplicity, find and walk the path that leads to compassion and wisdom.
that leads to happiness, peace, and ease. Welcome the stranger and open your heart to a world in need of healing. Be courageous before the forces of hate. Hold and embody a vision of the common good that serves the needs of all people. Thank you.